Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here, and I'm doing a movie review this week. It's a spellbinding, magical fantasy drama that came out on December 1st of last year, and just recently won four Academy Awards, including Best Picture and Best Director. And it's also coming this Tuesday on Blu-ray, along with DVD, 4K, and digital. It's called The Shape of Water. It's a story about a young woman who's a mute. You know, she can communicate with sign language. Who's about to help a wonderful sea creature that's an amphibian man. Not only does she fall in love with him, but she also tries to help him escape from being caught by the government of a secret uh, facility. So together, with the help of her friends, they'd be able to save the man from being killed. And be able to take him for where he belongs, in the docks. And I just saw this um, again, the second time around. Uh, I actually put this on my top list of 2017. It's actually on my number 21. Yeah, so I couldn't make it to the top 10, but that's okay. Because there were a lot of good films coming up. So it was kind of hard to list which one. Because I know my number one had to be Blade Runner 2049, come to mind. But this was pretty interesting coming from a legendary Hispanic director... Guillermo del Toro, because he's been known for doing a lot of films, especially when he throws in some creatures aside, and all these dark fantasies that's going through it. So this was like a a dark modern fantasy fairy tale right there, just like uh, a decade ago with Pan's Labyrinth. So it was just like that, but this was a whole different story. Um, it does have a Big of a comparison with two films already as an inspiration to Beauty and the Beast and the creature from the Black Lagoon. Yeah, because of you know Gilman, the sea creature that, that came from a swamp. And this was an inspiration right there too because um, this was actually played by Doug Jones. Because Doug Jones has been known for actually playing a lot of um, interesting characters yeah because that's why he's been working with him for so long but he also had work in, in the business for you know providing um, all these um, interesting characters and you know he usually doesn't talk much but he does actually uh, communicate and does everything he can usually they always dubbed his voice other times they'll just uh, He'll be able to act very well. But he's been in the business for a long time. Yeah, even the earlier, too, with Hocus Pocus. So that's probably another reason why he got the business to do a lot of that. And this is pretty interesting because it almost reminded me of um, the character that Doug Jones once played in the movie Hellboy, which was also directed by Guillermo del Toro. In fact, uh, for those who don't know, I mean, he played uh, he played the role of Ape Sapien. Yeah, which I know in the first movie it was dubbed by David Hyde Pierce from Frasier. So I, I figured, yeah, <laughs> I began to hear uh, Niles, yeah, Frasier's brother, uh, in there. So I thought that was really clever before he went on to do his own voice in the sequel, which is The Golden Army. Yeah. But yeah, he has played a lot of roles uh, that makes, makes him more interesting, especially when he played uh, the Fawn and the Pale Man in the movie Pan's Labyrinth. So this was really interesting, too. So he has done a lot of roles um, that are mostly creatures or any kind. So there you go. And then, of course, you got Sally Hawkins, Hard to believe, Sally Hawkins uh, from Paddington 
to actually be in this film and apparently she was nominated for that role and she's actually very good uh, communicating with sign language that she had to do she had to study a lot to actually play that role and she actually um, doesn't speak at all I mean yes until there's actually one scene which I don't want to give it away but that's a big surprise right there she really did uh, the best she could. I mean, it almost reminded me like when Marley Madeline, because I know she's a real deaf actress in the movie Children of the Lesser God, where, you know, she plays a deaf woman, mostly because she's a student of, uh, of a teacher uh, for sign language, so they begin to communicate by using you know, all their fingers to to create those signs. So there you go. <laughs> and of course they fall in love too. In a similar way. Yeah. I gotta see that movie someday. You know, I, I it's been a long time since I've seen Children of the Lesser God because that was a good movie and interesting enough Marley Matlin won the Academy Award for that. So, um, unfortunately Sally Hawkins didn't win for this movie. That's a shame. I didn't watch the Oscars this year, so keep that in mind. But it's nice to hear that that it won four Academy Awards, so I'm happy for that. And looking at this movie again, uh, I just—it's just amazing the way they shot this. They 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 shot this in the, in that particular location. Uh, although they did say the movie was shot in Canada, which I think maybe that's where they used the sets here. Because the movie is supposed to be set in Baltimore, Maryland, so it gives that feel to it. That classic uh, 60s feel, even though it's a, it has a mix of 40s and 50s in there, as you can see it. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. And coming from Guillermo del Toro, the last movie I saw was Pacific Rim, which I really did enjoy. That was a film about a giant robot, you know, Versus uh, a giant monster creature, yeah, sort of like you know Transformers meets Godzilla in a way, or any other kind. But I thought this worked really well. I know there's going to be an upcoming sequel yeah, that's going to be in March called Pacific Rim Uprising, but this time he's going to produce the film instead of directing it. Yeah, so let's just see how that film will turn out. <laughs> But I did enjoy Pacific Rim. I really did. It was fun. I mean, I wish it had done very well at the box office, but it unperformed uh, not very well, but at least it made, made its profit and earned more money worldwide, so it helped. It was enough to give it a sequel. So let's see how it happens. I didn't see Crimson Peak, though. That was one movie I skipped. Um, even though it does look pretty interesting, especially when it stars Mia Roshashka and Tom Hiddleston, but sadly, um, I didn't get a chance to see it in theaters. Um, I heard a lot of mixed reviews on this movie, but it would have been nice to check it out for a change. So maybe if I find the Blu-ray uh, for a lot cheaper, or hell, maybe uh, take a chance at it, I will see it. But anyway, um... But this movie, on the other hand, this was a big surprise. And coming from him, I'm, I'm glad he's still continuing to make more movies. Especially when he's doing all these producing of all other films that he's doing. While in the past he's been directing other films as we all know and love. Like Chronos, Mimic, you know, the first two Hellboy films, you know, The Devil's Backbone. You know, and of course, Pants the Labyrinth all come to mind those movies just proves how much of a very talented writer director and producer he really is and he'll still be that way and I'm also happy to see that he finally won the Oscar for this movie so I give him credit for what he does and I'm happy he got it so good luck for him so let's get to the movie it stars Sally Hawkins from Paddington Michael Shannon from films like Premier Rush, Midnight Special, Man of Steel, 
as well as nocturnal animals. Yep. Richard Jenkins, been several films including The Witches of Eastwick. Octavia Spencer from films like The Help, along with Hidden Figures and several others. Michael Starbarge came a long way from the film A Serious Man by the Corn Brothers, but he also has been in other films before and after that movie, including Steve Jobs, Men in Black Free, just recently Call Me By Your Name, that movie, and The Post, and of course even Trumbo with, uh, <laughs> with Brian Cranston. Doug Jones, as I mentioned, been in several films working with Guillermo del Toro and many others that he's been in. David Hewitt, Nick Searchy, Stuart Arnott, Nigel Bennett, Lauren Lee Smith, Martin Roach, and Allegra Fulton. It's written by Guillermo del Toro along with Vanessa Taylor and is directed once again by Guillermo del Toro. The movie began set in 1962 in Baltimore, Maryland. We meet a young woman named Alicia Esposito, who's played by Sally Hawkins, who started out as an orphan girl who's been found near the river with huge clawing scars on her neck, and she's also considered to be a mute. So she's been a mute for a very long time. She can't speak, but she can communicate by using American Sign Language, by using her fingers and her hands, so she can communicate with everyone, even for those who don't understand the language very well. So, of course. But she does have an interpreter to help. She lives at an old apartment that's located inside an old movie theater that's um, playing a lot of widescreen films of any kind of old movie and the theater owner actually owns the theater and collects all the rents that she had to pay every month so she'll be able to stay in for a very long time. She also lives next door to an old man who happens to be gay, nothing wrong with that, but he's an artist yet working for an advertising agency, including that one particular uh, painting and portrait of a Jello ad that he's about to send. His name is Giles and he's played by Richard Jenkins. Elisa actually works inside a secret government agency with uh, her best friend and also an interpreter named Zelda who's played by Octavia Spencer. All of a sudden they discover that there's actually a creature that's coming from the sea that's being captured by the government and all the scientists involved including Colonel Richard Strickland who's played by Michael Shannon who actually was the one who captured him from the South American River and was brought into the lab so they'd be able to communicate or be able to find out some secrets behind them. So, so he is the one who was in charge of the entire um, experiment that's happening. Or what seems to be. So Elisa basically discovers the creature even though Elisa and Zelda just spends time you know cleaning all of the pee and the feces and any kind yeah because they are janitors so they always go to the restroom and always cleaning everything try to keep everything neatly as possible just folding all the towels you know putting all the soap and everything that they need so uh, Richard had came trying to see how they're doing because uh, he was just going to the restroom and trying to find out what's 
what's going on. So he was trying to experiment with the creature, and the, it, the creature turned out to be an amphibian man. He was actually played by Doug Jones. But suddenly, he was missing two fingers right here, because the creature actually had bitten off uh, his two fingers that was missing. So then, Elisa, along with uh, Zelda, had to clean all the blood that's coming from the lab. And then, um, suddenly she found the two f missing fingers, so that way they'll be able to um, perform surgery for, for Richard Strickland. So, he survived, he was okay, he was, he was losing some blood, but he was doing great so far. So then they begin to uh, suspect uh, Elisa and Zelda about what's going on. And they're talking about uh, who these two are, and, and, and they had to explain fully. So, of course, you know, Zelda had to do all the talking, so he's more, she's more the, the interpreter for Elisa. Well, she just communicates by using her sign language. Well, anyway, she started to communicate with the creature, the amphibian man, by actually giving him some um, hard-boiled brown eggs. Yeah, because that was her lunch. And yeah, she always makes all these hard-boiled eggs. So she, she begins to feed him. Begins to uh, communicate him. I mean, most of the time the amphibian man is either um, in the water or inside the uh, the tube. You know, just flowing around, just so that way he can survive down there. Because unfortunately, he can't breathe uh, when he's not underwater. Yeah. So when he's out of the water, yeah. He, he can't breathe, you know, he will die. You know, that's why he has gills. So then, Elisa had experienced that there was a secret behind all this, where suddenly she's became very suspicious that that uh, Strickland turns out to be, as we expected, a very sinister guy. I mean, basically, you know, he's just working, trying to... Um, you know, help out the creature, but then it turns out that he's actually hurting him completely. He's actually torturing him by actually using the cane, the uh, the taser cane. I've been tasing him a lot, so she was very shocked about what's going on. Uh, of course, we do have um, a scientist uh, named Dimitri who's played by Michael Starbarge, which he also has a secret of his own. He turns out that he's actually a Russian spy. He's actually working with two people who actually was about to give him a serum so that way he'll be able to use it to um, to actually um, calm down the creature. But in reality, though, he's actually trying to help out the creature, so that way, you know, they don't go around killing him. So, and because of that, um, Elisa decided to, um, with the help of, with the help of Giles and Zelda, they together decided to disguise themselves to actually escape, to take the creature into the laundry vac, and into the. Uh, into the van so that way they'll be able to take them straight home you know, for only a few days so that way he'll be able to recover by pouring uh, some salt inside the bathtub you know putting all these uh, the green chemicals inside so that way the creature will breathe yeah, it wasn't an easy tax though but apparently Dimitri actually helped them out just when he began to suspect uh, what's going on inside the uh, the basement, and that's when he begins to help uh, Elisa, Zelda, and even Gels to actually take the creature to escape. So that was cool. So as as it goes along, 
during the, the last few days before they were planning to actually take uh, the creature back into the docks you know, during a rainy day while um, Strickland of course was trying to go after him but he can't seem to find the creature anywhere so of course you know he's actually doing the job for the general named Frank Hoyt who's played by Nick Searchy and he's basically telling them that the, for such a good man who's actually doing his job and of course we also know that you know, Richard Strickland is a family man yeah he actually uh, he actually lives uh, with his wife and his two kids yeah I know there's also a sex scene and everything here and there he begins to tell him that um, if he's actually a decent man if he actually failed only once and that explains I don't want to give too much away, but that, that has that particular dialogue where it begins to explain that if if you actually did your good job already, if you only fail once, how can you be a decent man? But decency is just it's just full of shit <laughs> in that sort of way. Yeah. Well, as the creature has been uh, living with them for a while, and this is where. Yeah, this is where I, I just can't handle, you know, animal cruelty these days in movies. But that's okay, because it's always kind of heart-wrenching to watch. It's very disturbing, mildly disturbing, but I'm going to mention it anyway. But there was a scene where, uh, where the creature actually um, grabbed the cat and decided to eat his entire head. And the cat, of course, was named... Pandora, because we also learned that Joe's actually lives alone with his cats, and including all these uh, wonderful kittens. So, oh my God, that was pretty messed up. But in the end, the creature did learn his lesson. So now he begins to understand better. I mean, I, I understand. I mean, he didn't know. It was a mistake that he made. But hey, I guess it's part of nature of being. So that's how it happened. So, so as um, the day settles, I mean, because now um, Elisa is uh, once again communicating with the amphibian man, actually helping him out, and, and actually falling in love together in that wonderful scene where they're inside uh, the bathroom, yeah, they're taking a bath together, and in this wonderful scene where, where they, they left the rotter running, and suddenly uh, all the the water is is going all the way full into the bathroom and yes and all that water is dripping all the way down into the feeder so that's when they noticed that once they were watching a movie um, on that lower level all that water is dripping from the roof and yeah it was going over the place so he was trying to tell them to stop it uh, we also learned though that um, accidentally the creature had um, scratch um, jowls and then uh, suddenly he actually uh, heals him so then you begin to notice that he was he was getting healed and it was it was really amazing that that uh, that this amphibian man is actually uh, very kind I mean and gentle and he, he really helps out so by the time they finally decided to take him back to the the docks on a rainy day, yeah, that's when the, um, then that's when Richard Strickland, along with his assistant, decided to to sneak out, uh, trying to find out what uh, Dimitri was doing all this time. Yeah, he actually took out those two guys because even they were trying to threaten him. As we speak, yeah, he is he's also speaks Russian. Uh, for Dimitri, of course, to those guys. So then he begins to try to find out uh, what's going on and where's the creature. So he's trying to go after uh, Elisa along with Zelda and yes, e even uh, Giles to actually um, try to um, get to the docks, you know, before it's too late. And and that's what happened too.
as we speak. Um, but anyway, it is a beautiful, wonderful film. It's very magical, very spellbinding as I speak. And I really did enjoy it. Uh, the cast was great. They did a very good job, no doubt about it, including Sally Hawkins, who's very good as Alisa. And in fact, she, she put a lot of hard work into it by actually using all the sign language and being a mute all this time, so she's trying to communicate. I know it's not an easy task, too, because, you know, I started using sign language uh, when I was uh, taking a sign language class in college. Yeah, so as I mentioned, yeah, I started to use all these particular signs uh, with my fingers and my hands. And I, I know I'm trying to communicate very well, like, you know, like when I'm trying to spell my name, J-O-S-C-P-H. And also, um, any other languages, like, and, or something like that. It's kind of hard to understand sometimes, but once I get used to it, I mean, I had to continue to go through it. But that's what I did. So I, I can see how much hard work it, it had to take for Sally Hawkins to do it. So, yeah. And by the way, that is the truth, because I have taken sign language class, okay? So I'm not lying. It wasn't easy. I mean, I actually had once failed that class. And I had to take it again, I had to repeat uh, by taking the class at GCC, because I took it once at PCC, it, it didn't work out. Yeah, I had some tough times over there, and then I had to deal with a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, it wasn't easy. But at least I did pretty well, though. I mean, it was a lot of hard work, but I had to try my best to do whatever I can. It's been a long time since I've used sign language. I don't even know if I want to be able to use it, because it's not easy. But who knows, maybe I'll try to work at it someday. Well, anyway, um, but I thought Sally did a great job, nevertheless. Um, just proves how much of a good actress she is. Yes, there were some nudity in her performance. I mean, I did see her. It's hard to believe, because I always imagined her in the movie um, Paddington because that's a family favorite film so this time apparently she just uh, you know she has to take a bath um, in the nude I mean that's that's natural we always take baths in the nude anyway we don't we don't take baths while wearing our clothes on yeah that's for sure um, anyway also Michael Shannon you know Basically, as usual, playing some sinister roles, and this is definitely one of them. But he also has played different roles, too. And I really thought that his character did a great job. I mean, playing a very, um, a very corrupt uh, military uh, official, but he's also the colonel trying to do his job. Um, no matter what he does, I mean, and he also, of course, eats some, some candy that he buys. I mean, he loves to chew and, and eat some candy while he's making a conversation with everyone. So that's how sinister he really is. Also, Richard Jenkins was very good, too, like, as a, uh, a neighbor who's, of course, who's in the closet. But, of course, you know, he has trouble trying to communicate with someone. I mean, mostly because he has trouble communicating with Elisa, because he had to do his work. Um, he, in fact, there was even one scene where he and Elisa had actually go to um, a local restaurant just to have some pie. I mean, he loves uh, key lime pie, but unfortunately, uh, Lisa doesn't. And that's why there was a scene where he actually collects all the key lime pie in, in the refrigerator. <laughs> that was cool. Yeah, Octavia Spencer, very strong performance uh, as Zelda. Uh, definitely the right interpreter for it. I mean, it's interesting seeing that this was a black woman that I can, that you can actually uh, deal with. I mean, you definitely feel that she actually takes good care of her best friend. 
And I, I love all the communication and, and all the dialogue that she was given. But at, at the end, she does help. I mean, even though she doesn't want to get into trouble, so, of course, <laughs> she doesn't want to lose her job, beat her. That's all I can say. <laughs> but she was great. Um, of course, Michael Starbarge, um, as a scientist, he wants to take good care of the creature. He doesn't want to kill it. He wants to help him. I don't blame him. So he's always helping out, so that way nothing bad will happen. So that way the creature doesn't get killed. But of course he he has a secret that he's actually a Russian spy. So so as a doctor, he's trying to get all the serum that he needs so he'll be able to use it whenever. And Doug Jones, yep, as the amphibian man. Wow. I gotta say, Doug Jones did an awesome job portraying that role. I mean, it wasn't really easy, but it's always great that he gets to act behind the makeup and the costume that he had to wear. Because he did a lot of that. I mean, he's he's a special effect right there. There's no doubt about it. He definitely does everything he can to communicate and use all the movements and and all the the warring sounds that he does and, and how he makes and there's also a mix of CGI with the um, the healing process where he actually heals someone, including Elisa and uh, and Giles. I, that was really interesting, amazing. But the rest of the film is just practical right there, so it's perfect coming from him. It really works. Also. Just to point this movie out, because I don't usually point it out very well, but that's okay. This time it's going to be perfect for me for this review. There's a lot of symbolism in this film. I begin to notice that too, because when I watched the movie, there was everything that involves the color green. Because, like Kermit the Frog says, it's not easy being green. <laughs> in that sort of way. But yes, there were a lot of uh, green colors uh, throughout uh, the entire movie, like such as the keem lime pie, as it's been the, as it's shown. I mean, mostly because Giles loved keem lime pie; that was his favorite. And he's actually putting it inside uh, his refrigerator, yeah, which also has a green color. I think a teal color too. The dresses are in teal. Along with uh, a Cadillac that uh, Richard Strickland had uh, bought, a brand new Cadillac. That's, of course, like a bluish green, but it's a teal, as he found out. The bathroom is, um, is also green. Even the soap is green. The entire film, in certain shots, was actually shot in the color temperature of teal. It does have some luscious colors too, so it has the mix of, of green, and of course we all know the creature, because he is green, brownish green. And yes, even the water, in that one beautiful moment when the Elisa was with uh, the amphibian man, and they were hugging, they were kissing, and they were, they hold their arms together, Dancing too. Yes, they were even dancing in the bathroom in the water. That that was just so beautiful the way they did it. And of course, uh, there's also scenes where um, Elisa loves to dance. I mean, she was watching an old film on an old uh, black and white TV set. I mean, she she just never forgets. I mean, she loves to dance in that one particular scene where she's just coming out of the, the apartment and just started to communicate just like what they did in, in a musical that she was watching. She started dancing and exactly like how they did it. It, it was just unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I love the score. It was actually done by Alexandre de Plot. He actually created a wonderful score that actually fits the movie very well. There is a bit of mix of other songs, uh, 
like Baba Lou, yeah, from I Love Lucy, but it's done differently this time, so it's not Ricky Ricardo. And even a song called A Summer Place, so there's a bit of uh, some 50, 40s, 50s, and 60s vibe to it. And I love that. I mean, it, it really brought its inspiration justice here. Even though, yes, this movie is set in the period where it's the civil rights movement, you know, things are not going so well for for diversity. I know they're not getting along with them, you know, such as gays, blacks, even with people with disabilities, yeah, disabled people. I mean, they don't get treated with respect, and that's a shame. But yet, they had to portray, the, you know, whites as either racist or or very cruel or any anything. But of course, not all whites are bad. They're, they're not idiots, or assholes, and everything. I mean, there are actually very smart people too. I mean, yes, and there's even a Russian who's actually very nice too. But he's trying to help. So there you go. I mean, this is the situation during the Cold War that's happening. On, in that time period, so, wow. Well, anyway, it's a great film, highly recommend it, and I hope you get to check it out pretty soon, because if you love fairy tales and all the fantasy stories out there, especially since it's a movie that's, that's, an ins that's inspired by two films already, which also were based on stories and everything, like Creature from the Black Lagoon and Beauty and the Beast, then this is definitely for you. Because, yeah. trust me, you'll never forget. So anyway, I give The Shape of Water five stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.